This is the second mini-movie in the UW-Madison Campus Voices series. I'm Troy Reeves, head of the Oral History Program at the UW-Madison Archives and Records Management Services, and today's host. This mini-movie was created to mark the 40th anniversary of the Sterling Hall bombing, which took place at 3.42 a.m. on August 24, 1970. The bombing has become one of the more infamous events that took place on U.S. soil during our country's involvement in Vietnam. It also stood as the largest act of domestic terrorism until 1995 and the bombing in Oklahoma City. While we do not pretend that our small movie will become the word on Sterling Hall, we do intend to offer a version of the tale using images and voices from the UW-Madison Archives collection. Almost every story needs context, so we begin with words and pictures depicting the student protest movement on campus up to August 24th, 1970. During the four years that I lived in the dorms, one year in Witte and three years in the Celery, uh, this was the period of maximum demonstration on campus against the Vietnam War. I came here in September 67. A month later, in October 67, was the uh, demonstration against the Dow chemical interviews in the old Commerce School behind Bascom Hall. And uh, I remember quite vividly being aware of something going on there. During my three years as a house fellow, there were uh, various demonstrations on campus. And sometimes from our dorm windows and celery, we could see demonstrations outside. We could see kids marching down Johnson Street. Uh, we could see police cars. We could see uh, police chasing students, etc. From the ninth floor window in, in my room, I could actually I could hear and see and smell tear gas grenades being thrown. You know, you, knew that you could hear the sounds of glass being broken, you could hear yelling, you could hear sirens, you see fire engines. I mean, kids would light fires on campus, so it was a pretty distressing time. A particular focus of anti-war sentiment on campus was the Mathematics Research Center, housed on the second, third, and fourth floors of Sterling Hall. Since its establishment in 1956, the center had been funded by a contract with the U.S. Army. Many thus referred to the center, in short, as Army Math. It, it had been a demand for years that Army Math be off campus, that we felt that what Army Math did was the mathematics behind com very sophisticated computer warfare that was going on in Vietnam. Uh, they designed weapons that were designed for the purpose of killing and maiming as many people on the ground without putting American troops at risk. And we felt that, that that mission to design those weapons was incompatible with a peaceful learning environment and that Army Math should leave campus. And that demand had been made and ignored for years. We knew and we had tried as hard as we could to make it clear that the Math Research Center was not doing any classified work, uh, pure research project, uh, but the propaganda against it was rather fierce. It was obvious to me that something was going to happen because this is, where could it go? It wasn't going anywhere. It wasn't getting <clears throat> less tense or less violent or less anything. It was getting more and more and more. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, somebody is going to do something. There was stuff being said, you know. I mean, I didn't personally hear anything at all from anybody, but it was just that sense of, uh, you know, it's, it, you know, it's, 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 it's going to happen. Something's going to happen. In the early morning hours of August 24, 1970, four men, Carl and Dwight Armstrong, David Fine, and Leo Burt, drove a stolen van up the driveway alongside Sterling Hall and parked it. Inside the van were barrels of ammonium nitrate and fuel oil, along with sticks of dynamite. Fine called university police to warn them of the bomb. Carl Armstrong lit the fuse, and the four jumped into a car and drove off. A few minutes later, the bomb ignited. The explosion was heard for miles around. At, that at the time of the bombing on August 24, 1970, I lived in a house with two other guys on Breeze Terrace, and it was about 3.45 in the morning, and all of a sudden, there was this huge explosion, which we could easily hear on Breeze Terrace. It just shook our house. It shook the windows. We didn't know what had happened. And we ran out to the front porch. It woke all three of us up. And we saw these huge flames leaping into the air from Sterling Hall, 
one of my roommates got in his car at you know quarter or four in the morning and drove to campus and he came back and he said well they finally did it meaning they finally you know blew up the uh, Army Math Reach Research Center which is what they were trying to do. I lived on Mifflin Street at the time and heard a loud noise which when we uh, looked out the window and I could see a mushroom cloud going up very very high. It's conceivable I was the only person that ever saw it. Um, I could, it's hard to estimate the height but many times the height of the trees that were visible from the second story balcony. I mean, very high. I was asleep and all of a sudden heard this huge explosion. I thought it was a car backfiring that was parked right outside my window. Uh, it was that sort of a huge loud explosion and uh, I immediately ran out the door and looked up at the sky and literally there were papers coming out of the sky. It was, uh, you know, loosely turned of paper, because our apartment was exactly two blocks from Sterling Hall. I awoke at what, something like 3.15. We live about five miles or so from Sterling Hall. And uh, I heard a boom and, and, and woke up and I thought, isn't that strange? It didn't look like it was going to storm tonight. <laughs> And uh, then I went back to sleep at about six in the morning. I got a frantic call from the wife of a, of a, of a police officer who was a neighbor uh, saying, screaming over the telephone that they bombed Sterling Hall. Though the bombers later claimed that they planned detonation for early morning to avoid causing death or injury, the blast injured five and killed 33-year-old physics postdoctoral fellow Robert Fosnock who had been working through the night on a superconductivity experiment. In the first place, there was the concern for the, the safety of people in the building and have we got them all and what have you. And this was, it was a long time, quite a period of time there, establishing that everybody was accounted for that was in the building. They, they found and the, these are the firefighting people, of course, that have gone in there and had found the young research assistant. And I remember vividly him, him being taken out on a, on a stretcher with a, with a blanket over and he was dead then, and no question about it, but it was uh, The Sterling Hall bombing killed a good friend of mine, actually, Bob Fosnacht. He was the student who was killed. We were... Um, offices on a chorus in town. We both sang in it and we were good friends. His wife later worked with my wife in the ag school. So that oh. I, I took that very personally, actually. One of the most moving moments that I can ever recall was in front of Bascom Hall the day that Sterling Hall was bombed. And Fred Harvey Harrington, Eddie Young in tears. Tears reflecting, I'm sure, a lot of, a whole myriad of feelings, a whole range of emotions. But those tears were real. In addition to the death of Robert Fosnock and injuries caused to several others, the bombing inflicted tremendous damage to Sterling Hall, the surrounding campus buildings, and years and years of professors and students' research. The physics and astronomy departments housed in Sterling Hall received the brunt of the damage, while the Army Math Research Center was little affected. When I came over, uh, of course, uh, Sterling Hall was... Uh, not far from the west side of our building, right. yeah. and all of the windows on our uh, on our the west side of our building had been blown out, and my laboratory was on that oh side, my. and my sectioning room, and uh, Irving Shane was controlling uh, uh, access to the buildings, and I told him uh, who I was, and he let me through. Well, the uh, the damage in our lab was uh, extensive. I mean. Uh, some equipment was damaged, and there was. Uh, I could still go down there and show you glass splinters in the mm -hmm. in the doors. They destroyed the research of a number of physicists on campus. I remember some of them saying, "Why they aim at us?" So uh, it wasn't being aimed at. We are on their side. We're opposed to the Vietnam War, and so were many of the mathematicians in the Army Mathematics Research Center. Simply because they're doing research for the military doesn't mean they're in favor of the Vietnam War. I guess one of the considerations from my own personal interests at the time 
is not so much in in whether there was whether my books and papers were intact or not, or whatever, but whether or not there was going to be nuclear physics at this university after that. It was quite a while after, without going into details of how the accelerator is constructed, it's, it's fragile. And it's conceivable that if it had been, its main structural parts had been destroyed through the shock, that funds would not have been available to rebuild it. I and see, nuclear I physics at this university that. could have just come to a stop instantaneously, effectively. A good story also allows time at the end for reflection. We again offer some words and pictures from our collection reflecting on the legacy of the bombing, an event that received national attention, led to a multinational manhunt, shocked the UW-Madison campus, and caused profound change in the protest movement, at least on this campus. And so as far as I'm concerned, four nuts got carried away with all this, and uh, they did things which they shouldn't have done, indefensible, and uh, a man got killed. Uh, years of research of other people were totally destroyed. It was years, I mean, it's only been fairly recently that the effects of the bombing haven't been quite noticeable. For a long time after that, you would need some tool to do something. And yeah. you'd look around and say, must have gone in the bombing. You know? and yeah. it's, it's really been just the last couple of years when the bombing didn't sort of have, a, have an effect on what was going on. I went to the, one of the first rallies, or one of the first protests of the um, fall of 1970. One of the first things I went to, and it was like, where is everybody? Like, where is everybody? And all the built up um, energies from all the rallies and demonstrations and all the student involvement and participation was just reduced to a few hundred people because um, no one wanted to be associated with that bombing where someone had died. In the early days of the um, confrontations with police, in which the police behaved very badly as well as the students, um, it was easy for students to pose as heroes, to walk around with uh, their arm in a sling and with a bruise on their head and mm -hmm. so on. And it was, it was sexy to have been injured in the conflict and heroic to be engaged in it. Mm -hmm. Uh, but after the uh, Sterling Hall bombing, they said, what are we doing? We're becoming our enemy. Uh, and I, that, that really was, I think, all over the country, the turning point of the, the movement. This concludes the UW Mass and Campus Voices mini-movie on the Sterling Hall bombing. Thank you for listening. Check out our Campus Voices website for more information about this historic event and others in UW-Madison's past.